cake breakfast uh, in support of uh, Habitat for Humanity. So hopefully you come for that. It's, it's free breakfast. You can eat all you want. Uh, they will have a free will uh, offering though. So if you, if you come, just know that the expectation is you help support the work of Habitat for Humanity, which is awesome, awesome stuff. Uh, we'll still have class that day as well, so you can, you can fill up with pancakes and listen to God's word. Um, Lent, this Wednesday, Lent continues, so we have Lent services at 6.30, but you'll, we have a bring your own dinner starting at 5.15, so join us for that. Um, and then finally, uh, Concordia runs on a balanced budget, so that means that we set our budget based on the, the pledges that come in. Uh, those are due today, hopefully you saw the emails that went out, it's been in the newsletter, uh, and hopefully you brought it and you dropped it in the offering plate, or you submitted it via online, because that's one of the ways you could have done that. If you didn't, right, if you didn't submit it online, if you didn't submit it online, if you uh, didn't get, grab your card, if you forgot to bring it this week, we operate on grace, uh, just like God, so you, you can still go home today and, and send it in online, or you can bring it next week if you want. Uh, if you prefer not to do online, stop by the, the Welcome Center, and there's an envelope out there, and each envelope has uh, a letter uh, from me, plus the pledge card and an envelope, so you just stick your pledge card in there, drop it in the offering basket, and we're good to go. Uh, but we really need you to do that so we can set uh, the course for ministry this year where God's going to lead us. So uh, if you do that, that would be awesome. And like I said, bring it next week, drop it off the plate, put it in the uh, mailbox outside, or uh, submit it online. That's all I have for you in terms of announcements. Let's stand and begin our time of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for, for this day. For this opportunity, Lord, to come here and give worship and praise to you. Lord, to hear your good news and have you speak into our lives. Lord, but help us help us always remember it's, it's not just for us that, that we would hear. Of course, yes, it is for us, but it's not just for us. So Lord, work in us through, through your word, through song, through prayer, and work through us that we would hear it for ourselves and then take it out into this world and share your good news with others. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen.
Have a seat. You guys want to come on up? Today we have a baptism, and I love baptisms. There's, I know I've said this before, um, now I'll say it again. Weddings are okay. You know, whatever. 
because no one's really there for the message, right? No one's really there to hear what the pastor has to say. They're there to get to the re re reception, right? <laughs> Funerals. Funerals I like because people are looking, right? People are searching. They, 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 they need hope. They, the, the gospel is like they, they want the gospel. Um, so funerals. I, I like them in that sense. I don't like that somebody had to die, but I, I like them in that sense. I love baptisms. Because baptisms, I mean, it, it, it's purely, we're, we're concentrated on, on, on this right here, right? The, the MRI is not going to say a word today. Well, I don't know, she might cry. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully not. But she's not going to say anything. Nothing that you and I will be able to, to, to understand, right? But God's going to do a marvelous work here. God's going to bring, bring her to life. You, you look at her going, isn't she alive? Physically. But spiritually, the Bible tells us she's dead. But God's going to do a marvelous work here and bring her to life. This is awesome, awesome stuff. And I'm so glad that we get to do this today. So, you guys ready? When you're ready? Yes. All right. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Baptism is God's gift to us, through which we receive the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of sins, and we are brought into communion and fellowship with Christ and his body, which is the church. The Apostle Paul reveals the mystery and promise that we have in baptism when he writes, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we, we too may live a new life. Jesus says in the last chapter of Matthew, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the last chapter of Mark, our Lord promises, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. The Apostle Peter has written, Baptism now saves you. And just as, Lazarus, or just as Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb and into new life, so he does the same for us through the washing and regeneration of holy baptism. Receive the sign of the cross both upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. Sponsors, it is your task to confess with the whole church the faith in our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in whose name Amariah is to be baptized, to pray for her, support her, and nurture her in the Christian faith, and at all times be an example of faith and love to her. Is this your intention to serve her as a sponsor in the Christian faith? If so, answer with, yes, it is. Fantastic. Because Amariah cannot verbally answer for herself, we shall together on her behalf in testimony of the forgiveness and the birth of life of faith, which God our Father bestows in and through baptism, we will, an we will answer, sorry, we'll an answer on her behalf. So, answer with yes, I do believe to each of the following questions. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of all things in heaven on, and on earth? Yes, I do believe. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord and Savior, who was born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and on the third day rose again? Yes, I do believe. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life? Yes, I do believe. Do you believe in one holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? Yes, I do believe. All right, you ready? And what is this child's full name? All right, here we go. Amariah, Monique, Nicole, de Herrera, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, I love the Holy Ghost. Let's go. And Phil's got something for you. God the, God the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has given you new birth in, through water and the word through his spirit and has forgiven you, young lady, all of your sins. Through baptism, God has added Amariah de Herrera to his family to declare the wonderful works of our Savior who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And you, may the Lord bless you.
the great thing is that what God has done this morning through Amariah, he does for each of us, right? Through Jesus Christ. He has forgiven us all of our sins. And so we take this time of confession and absolution to confess our sins. To confess that just like Amariah, if we're left in our sins, we're dead. Right? We have no hope. But Jesus has come. And he's come to give us hope. He's come to give us life. He's come to forgive us all of our sins that we might be called sons and daughters of God. So let's come before him now. Acknowledge, yeah, Lord, we, we've fallen short. And we need your forgiveness. And let's hear his grace. Those words of grace and forgiveness wash over us. We confess our sins now. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the, the beautiful life you've given to Amariah. Through the waters of baptism, through your word, Lord, you have brought her to life. Lord, through the work of the, on the cross, through what your son has done for us, you brought us to life. Lord, because we are sinners. We each have gone our own way, like sheep wandering. We, we've, we've scattered, we've run off. But the good shepherd has come, and he's come to call us back to him. Lord, we don't have to make ourselves right because we can't make ourselves right. But through Christ, you have made us right. Through his death on the cross, his resurrection, by your grace, you have forgiven us all of our sins. And you have called us yours, your sons and daughters, your children. You've forgiven us. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Thank you for forgiving us our sins, for calling us into the light and out of the darkness. Help us now to live for you, for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's stand.
Lord God, Heavenly Father, there is no way we can come before your throne, not out of our own, not with who we are on our own. We can only stand before your throne because of what Jesus has done for us, because Jesus gave his life to redeem us, because the sinless one gave his life for sinners, because he gave us his righteousness and took upon himself our sins. And because of that, Lord, you tell us, you invite us to come before the throne to receive mercy and grace. Thank you. Thank you for the gift that is ours. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the new life that we have in him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Go and have a seat. So our uh, series is Stones. Um, and if you're new with us this morning, uh, we the idea behind this series is that these stones represent... The, so in the Bible, there's all sorts of stories about stones, right? Um, all sorts of them. And what we're doing in this series, we're taking a look at some of those stories and what they have to say to us about our sins, right? The stones of our sins, but more importantly, what they say to us about the grace of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. So I invited you all to grab a rock, right? There's a sign out there in the basket to grab a rock before you came in. So hopefully you did. If not, go out and grab one now. Uh, and then during the service, uh, during communion, you'll have an opportunity to do something with that. That'll be your choice when we, when we come to that. Uh, that point in time. Our text today is from John chapter 8. <clears throat> if you brought your Bible, I'm a big fan of the Bible, right? I really think you ought to be bringing your own Bible each week. If you don't have one, I am happy to buy one for you. I'll, I'll get it and I'll bring it to you. Just let me know. Um, but if you don't have your Bible today, that page number there, page uh, 1059, is actually the Pew Bible. If you need to use that today, that's, that's awesome. So here we are. Uh, you get, let's say... 6,000 points if you brought your Bible today. Luke, uh, John, sorry, John chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Uh, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? <clears throat> they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down, started to write in the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. <clears throat> at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? <clears throat> no one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So here's what's happening, right? You read the same text I did. There's Jesus. He's in the temple courts. And he's teaching. And now we're, we're you know, getting farther along in his ministry. If Jesus speaks, people are going to be there. So the temple courts are filling up with people listening to him. And the Pharisees have gone and they've caught a woman... In adultery. Now, that's a whole other rabbit hole we could go down, but we're not going to go that way today, the caught in adultery. But they caught this woman in adultery. Now, certainly the law says that if she's caught in adultery, she's to be killed. The law of Moses is clear. Everybody knows that. If you read your Bible, you know that's what it says too. And so they caught this woman in adultery, and they bring her before Jesus. But if you read the text with me, you saw that they're not just concerned about the law. In fact, really, that's, that's farther down the line of priorities. What they're really after is Jesus. She's just a pawn, right? They really don't care about her. I mean, they do. They're righteous. We've got to take care of sin. So certainly, yeah, they'll, they'll go ahead and stone her too. But in the meantime, we really need to trap Jesus here. And so they don't want to take a chance that he's going to get done teaching and leave the temple courts. So they need to hurry up and get her there. 
So you can imagine what that means. They're not going to stop and wait for her to get dressed. They're not going to say, hey, you know what? Go ahead and get dressed, put on your makeup, have some breakfast, and then let's come out and, and, and meet Jesus. So there's a good chance she's standing there in the temple courts naked. Or at most, maybe she has a bed covering over her, some sheet or some blanket. But they don't really care. And there she stands before Jesus. And they say, hey, such women, the law says, are to be killed. What do you say? And everybody's got their rock. And they're waiting to throw them. So let's take that first phrase there. Such women. See, again, it's not a tea party where we say, uh, such fine women. Such women are here. This is a term of derision. And what they're saying basically is, hey, this slut, this whore, this piece of trash, she needs to be killed because that's what the law demands. What are you going to do, Jesus? What's your stance? What will you have us do? Everybody's holding on to their rocks, chomping at the bit to throw them. They can't wait to kill her, to trap Jesus and kill this woman. No one's throwing a rock yet. But they're killing her all the same. See, they're killing her by parading her out in front of everybody to see her guilt and her shame. They're killing her by their comments and their snide remarks. They're killing her with their looks and their hate, maybe even their lust. Either way, they're killing her. It would have been kinder, certainly would have been quicker, and, and, and more, <laughs> just better for her if they would have stoned her. But let her stand there in front of them, naked and ashamed, full of guilt, waiting to die. Be sure of this, she's dying. She's dying because she's standing in the temple courts. She's dying because she's paraded out in front of her people, in front of her community. She's dying a slow death because she's standing there in front of Jesus. Somebody once said that the religious people, that's all of us, the religious people are the only people who kill their own wounded. And based on my experiences, I'd say yes. I would agree with that. And that's what they're doing to this woman. They're killing her. Even without throwing a stone, they're killing this woman. Everybody is waiting to judge her. Everybody is waiting to throw their stone. Everybody. Except for Jesus. Jesus, the only one, the only one who is righteous enough, the only one who is worthy enough to actually condemn and judge this woman, he's drawing in the dirt. I mean, he's... He's drawing in the dirt. Think of the absurdity of what's happening here. He's been teaching. Everybody's listening. The Pharisees walk into this woman. She's a shambles. She's a wreck. And Jesus, Jesus' first thing, his first inclination is to stoop down and draw in the dirt. Now, over the centuries, people have speculated, well, what's he doing? What's he drawing? And some people, you know, being oh, smart and, 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 and figuring this out, because John has said, oh, well, we know what he's writing. He's probably writing the sins of the people there. I don't know, maybe. That could be it. I personally think what he's doing is doodling. <laughs> he's just down in the dirt, and he's, he's just doodling. But it's an act of genius, isn't it? I mean, this is an act of absolute, pure genius and grace. Because as Jesus stoops down in the dirt, as he's scribbling in the dirt there, what's everybody looking at? Jesus. Every single person is fixated on him. They brought her in here. He's been teaching, and suddenly, he stoops on the ground. No one's looking at the woman anymore. All eyes are off of her. No one cares anymore about that. They're wondering, what's he doing? What will he do? And then Jesus stops. He looks up. He says, you know what? You're right. You're right. Yep, you're right. I tell you what, so anybody here who, who's without sin, throw them. You're right. If you're without sin, 
You start throwing your stone. And he stoops down. Starts throwing stuff. Just silent. And no one moves. And all that hangs in the air are these words. Without sin. And one by one, you start hearing rocks drop to the ground. And one by one, everybody starts walking away. Everybody except for Jesus and this woman. And Jesus stops drawing, doodling, and he looks up, he looks around, he says, where did everybody go? What's going on? Where's everybody? They all leave? Did, did anybody condemn you? And for the first time, the first time this woman probably draws a breath, and maybe, maybe, possibly for the first time, her guard comes down a little bit and she says, she ekes out, no one. No one's there. Not yet. Because there's still somebody there. Jesus is still there. There's one more person looking at her, staring at her, staring through her. And as she says, no one, sir, you got to imagine her voice is caught. You've got to imagine her heart has stopped one more time because there's still one more person there, standing there with her. And then Jesus, with beautiful grace, says, I don't either. I don't condemn you either. Go and leave your life of sin. Wow. Are you kidding me? Beautiful grace. Beautiful words. Words that the church has forgotten how to say. Words that you and I have forgotten how to say. But words that a dying world needs to hear. We love this story. I have people all the time tell me, oh, I love John 8. I love what he does here. We love the story and what Jesus does, and we praise Jesus for his act of grace and compassion. And yet how often do we not show that same grace and compassion to one another, to this world, to the people who are lost? How often would we rather pick up stones than pick somebody up? How often would we rather condemn people than show compassion to them? How often would we rather sit in judgment of them then get down into the gutter with them and pray with them and love them. And here's the thing. Here's the astounding thing. It's bad enough that we don't do that for the people out of the church, but for the people who don't know Jesus. Man, we're willing to throw stones at one another. We load up for bear here. We pick up our stones, and we're, we're happy to toss them with our words, with our actions, with our thoughts, with our self-righteousness. You know what? Jesus says the same thing to us. He says the same thing to us that he says to the Pharisees of his day. Y'all got a rock, right? He says, that's great. You got a rock? You want to let it fly? Then do it. Throw your rock. You, you throw it and you throw it hard. If you are without sin, then you throw your rock. But therein lies the problem, right? We all carry our rocks. We all have our rocks. But who here is without sin? Which one of us is worthy enough, righteous enough to throw our rock? We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. See, the unfortunate thing is we act like the Pharisee, but we're all the woman. Each and every one of us is the woman. Each and every one of us is standing before Jesus, sitting before Jesus today, exposed. Naked before him for him to see our sin, all of our sin, all of our failures, all of our faults. We stand before him. 
with rocks in our hands. And you know what he says to us? You know what he says to you here this morning? He says the same thing to you that he said to that woman. I don't condemn you. Wow. He says to you, I don't condemn you. What mercy. What, what, what grace. That is grace. That is, that is the gospel. That's the gospel for you. And that's the gospel for me. It's the gospel for everybody. Jesus says, right, I didn't come to condemn. In John 3, 17, he says, I don't come to condemn. I, I come to save. Jesus did not come into this world to heap upon us more rocks of sin and guilt and shame. He came to remove those. He came to take them from us. He came to set us free. He came to show us a new way of living. He came to tell us the same thing he says to that woman. I don't condemn you, but I have a better life for you. Now leave that old life. Leave that old sinful life. And follow me. Come with me. Now many of us think, uh, Jesus was just being soft on sin here. I mean, come on, Jesus. Really, that's what you want to go with? Uh, just go and leave your life? Nothing? Nothing else? You're not going to say anything else, Jesus? You're not going to at least shake the rock at her and say, next time? Come on, Jesus, that's a little soft. Or some of us think that, well, you know what? That works for Jesus, but that couldn't work for us. I, I, we, we couldn't do that, right? Not in today. We, we, couldn't, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't say that. We couldn't say, hey, just leave your life of sin. There, there's got to be more to it, doesn't there? Doesn't there have to be some kind of uh, something, some kind of they, they, they need to you know, repent, they need to get right somehow? We can't do what Jesus did. We, we, we can't live like he did. But imagine what would happen. Just imagine if we didn't spend our time condemning others. If we didn't spend our time judging others. If we didn't spend our time looking for the right stone to throw, the right words to say, the one's going to cut them quick. The action's going to hurt them deep. Imagine if we didn't do that. But imagine if we were just Jesus instead. Imagine if we didn't say to the world, hey, I'm here to condemn, but instead we said, we're here to save. We're here to proclaim Jesus. We're here to shine his light. We're here to show you a better way, the way of Christ. Leave that old life, because he calls you like he calls me, like he calls all of us to something better. Imagine the change that would happen in our lives, in, in this church, in our world, if we did that. But hey, I get it. And you still might think he's being soft. You might still think that Jesus is being soft on sin. And if that's what you think, if you think he's being soft on sin, then you've missed it. I don't know what else to say, but you missed it. You missed the gospel. You missed Jesus. Jesus is anything but soft on sin. Jesus is the one who died for your sin and my sin. Jesus is the one who paid the price for all of us, for everybody, that we might know him, that we might be forgiven, that we might be sons and daughters of God, fully forgiven and redeemed, brought into his presence, his grace, his light, that we might shine it for others. Hey, you, you came here today, and I don't know if you came with a rock, words, intentions, actions that you're ready to throw. That you're ready to throw at somebody in your family. Maybe somebody in here today. Somebody at your work. Somebody at school. But you're ready to throw your rock of condemnation, your words of condemnation, your actions of judgment. Maybe that's what you're ready to do. And if that's where you are today, if you've got your rock and you can sit there and say, you know what? I'm okay with it. I'm righteous enough. I have no sin. Then keep your rock. Keep your rock. And you go ahead and throw it. But if you're tired of being a Pharisee, if you're tired of being a Pharisee, if you believe the words that Jesus spoke to the woman are the very words he speaks to you today, I do not condemn you. And if you believe those words are not just for you, 
but they're for everybody. Every single person, Jesus says those words to them too, I don't condemn. I've come to save. If you believe that, then I invite you to come out of communion and let go of your rocks. Let go of all your rocks. Leave your life of sin. Step into that new life that Jesus has won for you. I gotta say, if you drop your rock off in here, it doesn't mean you're soft on sin. What it means is you're being Jesus. I think that's what the world needs. And that's probably not for today. You know, here's the thing about this meal. That the only one who is worthy enough, the only one who is righteous enough to judge us, to condemn us, is the only one who gave his life for us. The only one who died for us. The, o- the only one who gave up everything for us that we might live through him. And here and now, today, he gives us his very body and blood that we would know his forgiveness, that we would know his grace for us, that we would live it for ourselves, and that we would be empowered to live it out for others. This is the beauty of this meal. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink, all of you. This cup is New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray now together the Lord's Prayer is printed on the screen. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So as you come up for a communion this morning, we'll start on this side over here. Enter through the, uh, come up through the center aisle. Come forward. If you want to drop your rock, you drop it in the basket there. Uh, then you can receive communion from Phil and I. Go back down through the, the first pew, and at the end is where you drop off your cups. This side, the same thing. Come up through the center aisle, drop off your rock, uh, receive communion from Phil and I, and then go back down the side aisle, and the tray is uh, outside of the first pew. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I knew I forgot something. If you're using the kits today, we'll commune you first. Uh, if you're new with us this morning and you're using the kit, Uh, just a word of of advice, kind of break that tab, it separates them, pull it back, and Jesus says, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Pull the next one, Jesus says, take and drink, this is my blood poured out for you, for the forgiveness of all of your sins, this do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me.
Please rise. And now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Take 
Jesus said of the, uh, the words, the, the words Jesus said to the woman are the words he says to you, that he did not come to condemn you. Do you believe those? Yeah. <laughs> not very convincing, but I hope you do, because those are words for you, and there are words for you to speak into the lives of others. This is who our Savior is. Let them know that. Let them know him. Let them see him through you, what you say, what you do. This world needs it. We'll see you next time.